very much for uh, coming uh, to this uh, book launch. Uh, can I pass this microphone over to uh, Victoria Chick, who will be uh, presenting uh, the, uh, the uh, or, uh, uh, yeah, oh, no, I'll pass over to Yanis Defermos, who will uh, Give the welcome on behalf of the department. Thank you and uh, many thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this book launch on behalf of the Department of Economics. And uh, the book uh, that uh, Jan is launching today, I think it's a, it's a very important contribution to our understanding of the economics of, my, of Kaletsky. And uh, what I think is very important is that uh, uh, Jan emphasizes these monetary aspects of, of the work of Kaleski. We know that he has worked so much and has contributed so much to, to, to our understanding of the monetary aspects of Kaleski. And one of the reasons why, uh, in my view, this is very crucial is because if we look, for instance, at the way that young heterodox economists think about Kaleski, in most cases, they focus quite a lot on the real economy aspects of Kaletsky. They know very well, for instance, his analysis about oligopolies, trade unions, the links between economic growth and inequality, uh, his analysis about the business cycle. But uh, what is very important is that they don't know very well the monetary and financial aspects of, of the work of Kaletsky. And I think this book and overall the, the work that Jan has done on Kaletsky highlights this and uh, allows people to understand why, for instance, we have to, to, to read Kaleski in order to understand uh, what is the impact of interest rates on investment, uh, the role of corporate finance, how we can conceptualize central banking nowadays, debt management. All these issues are very important. I think that uh, especially young heterodox economists are not very much familiar with them. And in most cases, when they work on finance issues, they uh, rely, I mean, especially if they use post case and insights, they rely a lot on Minsky. And I think the fact that we have this work of, of Jan is very important because it's a way for, for young economists to engage with this. Another thing that I would like to emphasize is that uh, the Department of Economics at SOAS is, I think, one of the very few departments that gives the opportunity to students, both at the postgraduate and the undergraduate level, to engage with Kaleski. Uh, for example, uh, I mean, in my macroeconomics module, I always give students the very well-known article of Kaleski about the political aspects of full employment, uh, which is an article that emphasizes why it's so important to analyze economic phenomena in conjunction with the distribution of power between different classes. And I think students enjoy that very much, and they overall enjoy very much the insights of Kaleski. And it's really a pity that we don't have this in most economics departments, I mean, Kaleski is not taught uh, in uh, macroeconomics modules and finance modules. And uh, again, this is why I think that uh, uh, what Jan has done over so many years is, is quite important, is very important, because uh, it's also a very good teaching material. And hopefully, in the coming years, we are going to see Kaleski more in the teaching of economics. Uh, so uh, it's a great pleasure for the department to, to host this event today. Uh, I very much look forward to the discussions, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that so many of you, friends, colleagues, are here. And uh, many congratulations to Jan for all the work that you have done for on Kaleski, and uh, enjoy the event. Thanks a lot. Better? Yeah. Good. Um, seems to write books as frequently as most of the rest of us send off postcards, it seems. 
an almost daily event that there's a book launch here uh, for one of his uh, one of his efforts. Uh, the last one I remember was the second volume of the Koletsky biography. And he, I think very wisely, chose to write a second, uh, write another volume on Koletsky's monetary theory, which really doesn't get the kind of press that a lot of Koletsky's work does. It, it sort of sits by one side and to have it brought out like this, very often in, in this case, by finding fragments of, of arguments and putting these arguments together, uh, that is a very great boon to us all. Um, we have three wonderful speakers. Uh, the other thing that Jan man manages always to do is to get the very best speakers. Uh, the first is Gary Dimsky. Uh, now from the University of Leeds. He started his career uh, in America, uh, more or less all over the place until he ended up in California at first at University of Southern California and then University of California at Riverside, but decided that Britain was the place to be because the population density was such that there was a real chance of academics talking to one another. It's true. And he, it's true. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's true. That's why he's here. And I'm delighted. Um, in the States, he also played quite a strong role in various government departments. And uh, in Leeds, he's um, also doing something for the city council. Uh, very importantly, from the point of view of putting this meeting together, uh, he's on the committee of the Post Keynesian Economic Society and um, is looking at Kovetsky perhaps, perhaps from that point of view. <laughs> So I, I give you Gary, I, I would like to introduce all the speakers at one time, but it's a little awkward to do. So I guess I'll break in uh, each time. They have about 15 minutes maximum, 10 would be even nicer um, to say their piece, Gary. I appreciate that, I will do my best. Good boy. <laughs> Watch I don't even have that, so. <laughs> so I have a lot to say, and I've been how's up. Good now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've been in dialogue with Jan and learned from Jan so much over the years by both reading and and talking with him. And uh, so it was a. I I really wanted to um, do justice to this this volume here, which I think is a real milestone. It is true he writes many books, but this is something special. And I was able to distill my thinking about it. Uh, and I'm going to kind of read with expression what I've written so I can discipline my mouth and say all that I want to say. So Jan Stock starts his book with a confession that it is true that Kolesky consistently underplays monetary factors. And indeed, as he refined his formulations, uh, he pushed money even further into the background. But now this book here, this is a scholar's book and its entry point therefore confronts its reader with a paradox. That is why a book called Interest in Capital about Kolesky, what's, what's, how does that work? Now my read, my decoding of Jan's intention is the following, highlighting the often implicit monetary components of Kolesky's work in an exposition, his exposition, that connects with Kolesky's overall vision of the capitalist accumulation process, permits a deeper confrontation with the limits of neoclassical theory than would a critique that was based merely on the obvious mischaracterizations in neoclassical theory. Uh, I, uh, to give an example, 
uh, if you if you've seen the May 2015 working paper by Jacob and Kumhoff that just brutally flogs uh, the exogenous money theory, you know you can do things like that, and it, and that's fine. They're, they're, it's it's descriptively wrong, but Toporowski has a deeper target here. He wants to take on the edifice of equilibrium-based neoclassical macro theory, both in its older and its newer forms, and and like Kalecki's formal models. These models too de-emphasize the role of money in economic dynamics. And so, you know, monetarism trivializes it. And of course the DSGE model, as we know, eliminates it. And uh, I should say, I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm speaking uh, e economic ease, but that's the level at which the book is written. So with due apologies, um, his attack links this erasure to another erasure, neoclassical theories elimination of any role for the capitalist firm. Uh, there in that theory, households are producers. Uh, this simplification leads directly to another deeper theoretic, deep theoretical error that Jan wants to correct. The idea that interest is linked to profits in a zero sum relationship. So just, just to remind you, uh, the, the neoclassical model, auto, agents automatically earn an expected return R for saving and whether, or, or for waiting, if you will. Uh, so whether you think of this R as an interest that you pay yourself or as a profit that your production earns doesn't make any difference. Notice that the real business cycle kind of morphed into DSGE and nobody really cared because uh, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter. There's only the representative thing that's at the center of this nothingness that's neoclassical theory. In that framework, R and the, the assumed availability of putty capital production technology governs agent choice. Rational agents automatically generate the finance that they need for the appropriate technology. Finance remains invisible because it's completely passive and dutiful. You don't need to see it and therefore it's out of the theory. This trade-off between interest and profit is one manifestation of what Keynes called the classical model and what's here called by Jan, the Vixellian approach. It's kind of, cause he's kind of making that monetarist connection pretty deeply. In that model, savings in advance are required to finance investment and aggregate demand has no role in economic growth. Now, of course, Keynes' revolution against the classical Pigovian denial of the necessity of macro policy took on precisely these premises. Uh, but how? Well, here's where we come with the first really fundamental point that Jan's making. Keynes' angle of attack on the Vixellian argument that the interest rate itself governs the pace of economic growth, builds on the notion, he, Keynes goes by saying, uncertainty begets fear and that destroys conventional beliefs and that gives rise to liquidity preference, which undermines investment. And it's not it's that, not the absence of saving. Fair enough, uh, but fear and liquidity preference in turn can be offset in that Keynesian vision, the vision we see in general theory uh, by basically maintaining a robust level of aggregate demand by appropriate monetary policy, et cetera. So everything depends on government policy, on what Minsky called big government, big bank in the face of recession. While this shows that how accumulation can falter, it does not describe the actual dynamics of capitalist accumulation. Government stabilization policy takes center stage um, while capital and capitalist firms remain off stage. Keynes has adopted what Minsky would later proudly describe repeatedly in conversation and in print as the Wall Street view of the capitalist economy. I don't know if you're saying that when you were there with him in Berkeley, but that, that was his mantra. And if you see that, there's a sense in which, you know, he's kind of that Wall Street view. It, it says a lot about the, the limits and the potentials of Minsky's view as well. Now enter in Toporowski's Koleskian opus, uh, corpus. This puts this capitalist firm center stage by focusing on corporate finance, not liquidity preference. The competition amongst capitalist firms, which involves investing when financing conditions are favorable, takes the place of liquidity preference. So greed driven by fear of being overtaken by rivals takes the place of the fear of uncertainty that can kill capitalist entrepreneurial drive. And capitalist firms competition gives rise to a, life, a, a business cycle whose lifeblood and, and whose aggregate demand driven aspect is the economy's monetary circulation. That monetary circulation is driven by what Jan calls capitalist money. It's the money of capitalists that you need to understand capitalist dynamics, not the money of government. 
there's another really provocative uh, point in the book, well worth much reflection. Um, and so that leaving that there, a perhaps surprising implication of this approach, something I hadn't fully realized, is that interest is not limited by profit. Instead, Jan points out, finance is flexible. Capitalists themselves and the banks on which they rely for credit are able to generate the, work, the money they need. Interest can be paid from the profits that will be realized once the investment thus triggered works through the expenditure multiplier. So Kolesky is the shield that Toporowski uses to confront, in a sense, the hydra-headed beast in a certain way, to build monetary elements into a framework that prioritizes the essential features of capitalism. This shield lets him take on the neoclassical orthodoxy and also calls him to question implicitly in the main some heterodox understandings of capitalism. So I've got five. One is the romance with Schumpeter. Now, keep in mind, two weeks ago, I, I met with the people over at the IIPP at UCL and the whole that whole thing. So I'm, it was kind of in my mind as I was reading this book. The idea that understanding capitalist growth is continually renewed, that understanding why capitalist growth is con continually renewed requires that we make space for Schumpeter's entrepreneur. No, actually, in Toporowski's Koleskian world, capitalists are not romantic dreamers. They're fierce beasts who give no quarter and invest to dominate. Toporowski reminds us that the core requirement for becoming a capitalist is to already own capital. That's third fundamental point that's made here. Um, and uh, basically, the power of capital is the basis of the process. We should not pine for worthy entrepreneurs whose blossoming requires only that they be connected with finance. Capitalism doesn't work that way. And in our work up in West Yorkshire and Leeds, this is something that we're confronting as a reality. How do you overcome that divide and level up and all of that? Because it, you know, it is what it is, it works as it works. Secondly, there's a gentle corrective for the Keynesian stock flow consistent models. Keynes's failure to ground his monetary theory in real-time dynamics driven by capitalist firms is reproduced in SFC modeling as such. The SFC model is, after all, a rediscovery of the Tobin Brainard macro portfolio equilibrium. That's an accounting framework that emphasizes point in time stock consistency and largely ignores motion through time. If you go and tra trace through Tobin's work uh, on that model through time, you know, he, he always reverts back to the equilibrium. And I know there's kind of jumped the other way and, and Giannis and many, many of our theorists today are working on and having a fuller vision. We have to keep in mind that that equilibrium is there as the test of the thing. And uh, once we, you know, go into other directions, then it challenges, are, are we in a sense pushing that framework beyond where it really can go as a description of capitalism? This is something that's Pose and that in a sense, Jan puts on the table. So this, this framework accounts for capitalism's scorecard, the balance sheets, but doesn't track the circuits of capitalist circulation in time. So in some sense, there's this kind of dialogue that we always have to have with the regulationists, with the circuit of capital folk and with SFC. We need all of those elements. And of course, that's one of our contemporary challenges as in a sense it was for Kolesky. Third, this volume's argument warns again implicitly against the idea that purposive smart government initiatives can rescue capitalism from its contradictions. Neither mission-driven growth nor modern monetary theory are mentioned here in this book, but both of those turn, since both of those turn on the idea that the failures of capitalism can be effectively countered by available policy levers, an idea that Jan's book calls into question, there is a debate to be had here. Uh, fourth, this volume briefly criticizes the literature on the financialization of capital, another really provocative uh, finding in the book. The idea that there's too much finance and reducing finance would be a cure. Uh, my gut, right, I believe with that, you know, all my work on the mega banks and all of that. But Toporowski reminds us that more finance can save capitalism from its own contradictions. Financialization embodies a crisis of one kind, but it also presents a means of escaping from crisis. Could we not say that this is a kind of Marxian uh, dialectic in motion? The insistence of, on the importance of modeling the capitalist firm and its financing process represents a view that planning and controls 
over investment finance, which is mentioned a lot in this book, that is explicit intervention into the drivers of aggregate demand and supply are needed no matter the form taken by the social relations of production. So it has to be said that, all, that going all this way with Toporowski's drilling down uh, into Kolesky's vision of capitalism does entail some costs. And there's some kind of points of critique or further discussion. One is that Jan's effort at making, carving out a clear divide between the money of capitalists and the money of the state arguably goes too far. It's a really provocative uh, point to read and to reflect upon. Um, and so I think that you know, it's, it's important for us to think about state and economy, Polanyi and all of that, uh, but there's much to be said there that, that uh, for further exploration. Secondly, his assertion that capitalists do what Kolesky says they do, that they invest by fiercely investing, they fiercely compete to generate profits is questionable in, in, in a world in which the circuits of industrial capital are paralleled by the increasingly dominant circuits of financial capital. The latter are based on speculation or buying to sell as Minsky would put it. So whereas capitalists made profits by exploiting workers in Kolesky's time, today there are capitalists who make profits by taking positions and fees in their own enchanted world to use Alain Lipiot's uh, uh, you know, phrase. Um, and the rentiers, of course, are there with as earning their share of Piketty's 1%. Thirdly, uh, Kolesky's two-class formulation, the assertion that workers are workers, is also problematic. In our time, people are divided by processes of inter and intra-class competition into the class fragments that are described by stratification theory. There's no recognition in this volume that the concentrated power of large capitalist firms and banks and their shadow bank empires has been used to super exploit those that are socially marginalized by divides of race, ethnicity, gender, or national borders. There's also no attention here to problems with developing nations. Now I gotta say, this is a short book and, and we're making some fundamental theoretical points here. So I'm, I'll hang on for the, the, my finale in a minute. Uh, so finally, this volume's discussion of monetary policy leaves much unsaid about the new era of quantitative easing. The transformation of money markets and position taking in pre and post crisis financial markets has forced central banks to be not just lenders of last resort, or as Perry Merling would have it, dealers of last resort, but actually to be everyday participants backstopping the barely controlled and often out of control gyrations of the over leveraged financial markets in which the mega bank dominated networks stake out their positions. That's the world in which we live. That world rooted in the dollar's exorbitant privilege and sustained by the Federal Reserve, catches Western economies in debt tracks that are deepened by COVID-19 now and by the Ukraine war. Not much is said about it in this volume, which would categorize these, these machinations as components of the money of the state, not the money of capitalists. So I'm out of time. So let me just say that uh, there's something to be considered in my final paragraph. In the next crisis period, a post-Trump US Fed will lack perhaps the policy space that Ben Bernanke was able to use to stretch the system to meet the 2008 Minsky moment. To create a post-capitalism that can survive the 2030s, we'll need more than economic insights that no matter how prophetic are rooted in the conditions of the capitalism of the 1930s. This means that we cannot allow this stellar monetary theorist to rest. We're going to need the next installation of Toporowski's reflections as he and we follow the arc of history. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you much, Gary. Well, Bill is uh, making his way forward. I'll start to introduce him. <clears throat> Bill Allen uh, worked for many years for the Bank of England. Um, and since then, or dur during that time, in fact, uh, also uh, advised the IMF and various other bodies um, and uh, wrote, uh, at the time, shortish articles on what the Bank of England was doing. And since then, two books have, t have turned up. Um, Jan, in introducing 
Bill on another occasion uh, described him as a central banker who thinks about what he's doing. And I don't think you can really ask for a higher accolade than that. Um, I think at the moment you're working for NISA or working yeah, with NISA? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm working I'm with NISA. Yeah. Uh, so he, he moves around a lot in good places, um, but he's spending a little time with us. Please keep track of the time yourself because I've come out without my watch. 15 minutes maximum, 10 minutes is better. Okay. Off you go. Thank you. Is, is this turned on? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. One of the uh, many virtues of Jan's a uh, fascinating and perceptive book is that it devotes a lot of attention uh, to chapters out of 12 to open market operations and that's what i'm going to talk about this afternoon as he rightly points out open market operations have been assumed away into irrelevance by a lot of theorists and so it's a very valuable contribution from him to have kind of resurrected them from oblivion um, they are an essential feature of, of central banking and of monetary policy. And of course, they've been undertaken on a colossal scale since the financial crisis. They haven't always been essential to central banking under the gold standard. They were not necessary, strictly, and they were widely thought to be undesirable. Um, the stereotypical bank of issue, as they were called in those days, confined itself mainly to discounting bills of exchange. Um, it determined the discount rate and the quantity of bills that it was willing to hold. But if, if holders of its banknotes returned them in exchange for gold as they could, the bank of issue was supposed to let its gold reserves fall in parallel so that money market conditions got tighter and interest rates went up. And that was the automatic magic mechanism of the gold standard, the rules of the game. Um, the reason why open market operations were thought to be undesirable was that they interfered with the direct relationship between the central bank's gold reserves and the domestic monetary situation. They were a way of bending the rules of the game. And of course, that's also the reason why they were thought to be a good idea. The purpose was to absorb some of the shocks that were imparted by the automatic functioning of the gold standard. So the central bank has accumulated reserves to excess in good times when it was plentiful and interest rates were low so that it could release the gold in bad times when interest rates were high. So it was a kind of countercyclical thing. Jan describes how the Federal Reserve discovered the power of open market operations by accident in 1922, when the Federal Reserve banks looking for income started to buy government securities so as to make their income bigger and happened to notice, or their statistical department noticed, that when they did so, the demand for credit from the commercial banks got smaller. And it was the Federal Reserve too in the early 1930s, which pioneered the extension of open market operations into what's now called quantitative easing by purchasing such large amounts of government securities that the commercial banks ended up with large excess reserves. And that's been hailed as a great success by monetarists and uh, with some justice, but even so, the scale of quantitative easing in 1931 to 1933 amounted to the equivalent of something like two or three percent of GDP. In other words, only a fraction of the amounts that have been done in the past 13 years. That was still in the gold standard era, just. Um, when exchange rates floated, open market operations became uh, not just a good idea, but essential. Uh, their purpose was often described in the Vixellian language that Jan uses in Chapter 10, keeping market interest rates in line with the so-called natural rate. Uh, making bank rate effective was what Richard Sayers 
called it in his history of the Bank of England. Now, jumping forward a bit, in 2009, quantitative easing was an emergency response to the collapse of the banking system. Since then, it has gradually become the preferred technique for monetary easing. Uh, there have been other devices which have been used, but they've all been dropped. Um, quantitative easing has kind of endured. Quite rightly, um, extremely usefully, Jan's book draws attention to the immutable uh, but widely forgotten relationship noted in 1963 by James Tobin between monetary policy and government debt management. It's more relevant than ever today, certainly more than 1963. Quantitative easing, in effect, has greatly shortened the maturity of the government debt, nowhere more so than in this, in this country. I don't think this has been widely recognized, at least until recently. If a central bank is free to do quantitative easing, then there is unavoidably a latent conflict between its freedom and the Treasury's ability to discharge its responsibility to maintain stable public finances. Of course, in this country, the central bank isn't completely free to do quantitative easing. Uh, it needs in advance the approval of the Treasury for each tranche, as it were, of quantitative easing. That being so, it's hard, at least hard for me, to understand why the Treasury has been ready to give its approval for such large amounts. One probable reason, though it can't be the only one, is that in March 2020, uh, when the coronavirus uh, pandemic became obviously serious, uh, quantitative easing was represented in part as a market maker of last resort operation or a dealer of last resort operation. And that was in an environment where government bond markets had ceased to function as the seriousness of the, of the pandemic became apparent. Now, the Treasury needs a reliably liquid market in which it can be confident that it can sell its securities. And a market maker of last resort was certainly needed uh, at that time in March 2020. But the functions of a market maker are to facilitate trading by quoting bid and offer prices and to achieve price discovery by matching bids and offers over time. So market makers buy and sell. The Bank of England didn't buy and sell, it bought and bought and bought. Now the only possible interpretation of its actions is that despite what it said, it wasn't acting as a market maker at all in any meaningful sense. It was actually pursuing a rather loose form of yield curve control in which it didn't announce its objectives for bond yields and maybe didn't have any uh, precise objectives for bond yields, but nevertheless suppressed the market forces that would otherwise have caused yields to rise. And by doing so, as I explained, shortened the maturity of the debt. Now, there aren't many instances of yield curve control in monetary history that I'm aware of. Both the United States and this country employed it during the Second World War to keep down the interest cost of government debt. Uh, of course, there was a huge amount of borrowing going on then. Um, in both cases, there was a period uh, not entirely unrelated of post-war inflation and a rise in bond yields. So a substantial fraction of the cost of the war was bought, borne by bond investors who suffered real losses on, on their assets. Much more recently, Japan has used and is still using yield curve control for a prolonged period and hasn't um, experienced any significant inflation. In Britain, inflation has in increased, as you all know, in the past year, and bond yields have gone up a bit. Up to the end of February 2021, quantitative easing had produced a large mark-to-market profit for the Treasury, which they had taken and spent. 
of £112 billion. But the Treasury is also responsible for the losses which, which will have been incurred in the latest year and for future losses if bond deals continue to go up. Um, so Jan is quite right to say that open market operations have a fiscal component. It's a very big fiscal component. And more generally, monetary and fiscal policy are ultimately indivisible. So Yan's decision to say so much about open market operations is timely and welcome and a very important contribution to the current debate about monetary policy and debt management. As I said, recent writers on monetary policy have generally assumed them away. Even the Bank of England has tried to separate uh, open market operations from monetary policy by not allowing its monetary policy committee to decide exactly what open market operations is to be done. Um, they have to choose from a menu which is approved by uh, the executive body of the bank. They should know better. And I hope that they and many other people will read Jan's excellent book and learn from it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lana. Jeff Tiley. Um, Jeff also had a, has a variety of careers. Um, he spent a great deal of time uh, having been trained as a statistician at UCL uh, at the ONS, Office for National Statistics and is one of probably the three best, uh, best informed people on the national accounts in this country. One of three. Um, still poring over those while he works for the TUC, <coughs> um, but many other things have claimed his attention as well. Um, when the ONS moved to Wales, um, that was the end of Jeff and the ONS, and he worked for a while for the Treasury. No offence to Wales. <laughs> no offence to Wales, just offence to the ONS. <laughs> um, quite rightly, too. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, it was a rather silly move. They, they, they should have known it, these all are good people. But um, anyway, he worked for the Treasury. Uh, for a while, and then at some point decided to come back to UCL, where he trained as, as a statistician, to do a master's degree in economics. And, uh, and he came across me, and he came across Keynes, and the combination was irresistible. <laughs> so, so he did a PhD on uh, Keynes in the post-Keynesian frame of reference. Keynes Betrayed, uh, which is probably still his best single, uh, single work. Um, <clears throat> much happier now in the TUC and, and tremendously productive, um, both his work on the national accounts and on Keynes are proceeding pace as he goes. And he will have interesting to say, things to say about Jan's book. Yeah. In 15 minutes or less. At most. Thank you, Vicky. Um, <laughs> sorry about the small handouts. But hopefully it's appeared on the screen. Um, well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for that introduction, Vicky. Um, so uh, at one level, I have much sympathy for Jan's project in reviewing Kalecki's monetary analysis is reviving monetary debates, which have been a central preoccupation of my work. But he appears to resolve the debates in favor of Kalecki, citing and I think agreeing that monetary factors are of no fundamental importance for the mechanism of the business cycle and rejecting the notion that the rate of interest affects the dynamics of the real economy. And when it comes to policy, the regulation of private investment was the most problematic way of securing full employment. I argue exactly the opposite 
in my book, Cain's Betrayed, which Vicky's just mentioned. And, and Jan knows this, not least because he reviewed the hardback in 2008. Um, he did so in an extremely generous way. And I've always been incredibly grateful for his willingness to give time to my work and for the broad reach of his scholarship. Nearly 20 years ago, he introduced me to J.A. Hobson and only last year to the equally valuable Jean-Claude Leonard Simon de Sismondi. Um, anyway, my, so my remarks are organised in four sections. First, I'm going to try and put matters in the context of post-Keynesian debate. Then I'm going to set out my take on Keynes very quickly. Third, I'm going to comment on the what I see as the a priori nature of Kaletsky's critique. And fourth, I'm going to try and look at some sort of re reconciliation. So Jan opens his book wanting to detach Kaletsky from Keynes, but I'm not the right person to do this. My reading of Keynes leads me to contest Keynesian economics on two main grounds. On theory, I want to get away from simultaneous equations that are opposed to Keynes's method. And then on policy, I want to emphasize monetary factors with fiscal in second place. It has always seemed to me that Kaletsky rivals both. Moreover, while the policy debate was fundamental, it has been obliterated. In his review, Jan noted that relevant debates with Kaletsky were omitted from Keynes's collected writings. And here Kaletsky himself is a little slippery. He claimed to discover the general theory ahead of Keynes but at the same time disputed Keynes's central conclusions around the rate of interest. For me, if Kaletsky has precedent, it is precedent for Keynesian economics. I sense in Jan's book some discomfort on the monetary front. He notes that Kaletsky may have been too confident about the explanatory power of his mathematical models. But for me, an opportunity has been missed, not only to confront the two approaches in a more neutral manner, but also to confront some of the murkiness of the economic debate that we're all interested in. So, to my take on Keynes, because the policy debate was obliterated, I'm obliged to revive the arguments that Kaletsky dismissed on the assumption that, unfortunately, you are not all familiar with my Keynes betrayed. Above all, Keynes was concerned with the cause and prevention of crisis. The focal point of his analysis was the classical theory of interest. And on page 75, Jan emphasizes how money capital and bank credit make that theory redundant. Keynes broke the link with supply side factors of thrift and technology and argued instead that the rate of interest could be set by policymakers. Over the 1920s, policymakers had allowed dear money to prevail. And he regarded this as the fundamental cause of the Great Depression. He required of policymakers a cheap money policy, a secular policy of low interest rates across the spectrum from short term to long. Immediately, this was a precondition for recovery, but more substantially, it was critical to the prevention of future crisis. His cycle process followed then from the interplay of the rate of interest, investment and animal spirits, captured by his marginal efficiency of capital, as illustrated on my small handout and on the chart behind me. My concern was always you know, was beyond just history. I began to get preoccupied with dear money as I did my PhD research in the late 1990s. I saw the Volcker shock and financial liberalization as bring, bringing to a decisive end the cheaper money of the golden age and restoring the monetary environment of the 1920s. So on the chart, we move from point K with high investment and low interest to point V with low investment and high interest. But this was increasingly coming alongside excess, not least in the dot-com boom. On this view, dear money becomes combined with a shift to, in the MEC to get exaggerated investment outcomes at point G or Greenspan. According to the president of the 1920s, this would not last. And sure enough, it didn't. I'm bound to find some vindication for my account in the subsequent and ongoing crises of the 21st century. But as the crisis hit, policy got even worse, as we all know. For some, 
After some immediate rescue action, policymakers reverted to type. The OECD called for austerity that would be brutal for some countries. And fundamental to the idea of austerity is the notion of living beyond our means. So excess at position Greenspan meant that we had to suffer at best point Volcker, but immediately given the collapse in the MEC that is characteristic of financial crisis, the even worse point Bernanke. Needless to say, Keynesians of all types were united to howl with rage, but with the MEC lost in the algebra of the Keynesian and Kaletskian economics, the full force of Keynes's argument is not brought to bear. For me, Kaletsky is concerned with the economics of this collapsed MEC, and plainly the difficulties of revival are immense. But let me first let me stress first that we confront these difficulties because policymakers were ignorant of or disregarded Keynes's prescription of prevention. Second, even in the case of fiscal policy, it is more difficult to make without recognizing the existence of point K. We were never living beyond our means. We were, and still are, living in the economic disaster zone of a dear money economy, and we can and we must live greatly better. Let me now turn to my third main point, that Kaletsky's critique was a priori and impervious to outcomes. Jan cites commentary from 1933, with Kaletsky arguing the rate of interest is endogenous to the credit cycle. I want to stress he was doing so just as politicians were for the first time making progress with not only reducing interest rates, but with wrestling money, monetary policy from the hands of central banks and financial interests. Britain came off the gold standard in September 1931. Cheap money began on the Treasury's lead from 1932. Most important for the world was Roosevelt in 1933, who literally built the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C., to take policy out of the hands of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Other countries followed suit as they followed Britain and the U.S. off gold. So incidentally, I see the failure of the World Economic Conference or rather differently to Yan in 1933. This was less a victory for nationalist and progressive and, and protectionist forces, and more a victory for the left and progressive political forces. And finally, there was the Attlee government. Their cheap money policy was explicitly motivated by Keynes's reasoning. And of course, their first act, I think it was, was to nationalize the Bank of England. But Yan tells us, Having set out a full account in his studies in economic dynamics of 1943, Kaletsky never came back to his reflections on the role of the rate of interest in the long term evolution of capitalism. I would contend that the Attlee government and the Golden Age more generally vindicated Keynes's approach. And as I showed earlier, undoing that approach has once again proved disastrous. My colleague on the panel, Bill, in his book about monetary policy in the 1950s, reports that Keynes's colleagues, Richard Kahn and Joan Robinson, were hostile to the end of cheap money. And Kahn took his complaints to the Radcliffe Committee in 1958. But apparently Kaletsky was silent. I would be interested to know whether Jan thinks this acceptable. So let me turn to reconciliation. In his book, I sense an attempt at doing so on Jan's part. He sees Kaletsky coming round to Keynes's approach to interest rate policy and advocating debt management techniques to set low interest across the spectrum. My minor objection is the approach gives too much emphasis to open market operations and not enough to Keynes's tap issue mechanism. My major objection is that the policy is set only in the context of fiscal policy and more specifically in the context of funding deficits. I want to offer an alternative reconciliation based on Keynes's sense of power relations that is notably absent from Keynes's approach. In Jan's account, this comes from the interplay of capitalist wealth and the corporate sector with investment critically contingent on the willingness of capitalists to part with their wealth. But going beyond these specific Going beyond these specific mechanisms, I sense throughout Jan's work in the broadest sense, a fundamental unease that the world can so easily be redeemed through monetary reform. Having for the past seven years thought about Keynes from the perspective of the labor movement, I am increasingly in agreement that monetary reform coupled with fiscal policy falls short of capturing the full implications of the general theory. I wrote about this under the title, A Second Internationalism of Labor, in the Progressive Economy Forum book of essays 
The Return of the State, which was edited by Jan and Sue Consman, so another book for the collection. Um, on this view, the rate of interest needs to be understood from the perspective of class forces more broadly as the return to wealth. And in a symmetric way, we might understand wages likewise as the return to labor. With any notions of natural rates firmly dismissed, the implication is that both are set according to power relations. And then the disasters of capitalism follow from orienting the system to wealth. And in this way, policy is less about technical technocratic adjustment of the monetary system and the government's fiscal policies, but a wider and perhaps binary reorientation of the economic system with the needs of labour rather than the needs of wealth paramount. With class forces operating on a global basis, this changed orientation must also operation, operate on a global basis, hence the internationalism of labour. You can read separately how it operates, not least in my blogs on the TUC website for free. Um, but I want to close on a different point. In the general theory, Keynes was preoccupied with preserving a role for market forces and individual initiative. I fear too often markets conflated with capitalism. So any solution partly grounded in private initiative is rejected out of hand. But the general theory tells us that the market may not be so dysfunctional when oriented at the interests of labour. The Attlee government proceeded with a number of nationalisations, but were content with this broader approach. On this view, socialism is but, on this view, socialism is not defined by its approach to the state and market. It is defined by its approach to wealth and labour. That's the end of my remarks. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Now, I suppose... The first question should fall to Yan. Um, and uh, I, I wish the others of you would filter back here as if you, there may be questions addressed to you. Hmm? Oh, what is that? I think it's better if you start the ball rolling, don't you? Right. Um, can I uh, thank, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, can I thank very much uh, all the, uh, all the speakers uh, for their uh, generosity uh, in uh, uh, in commenting on uh, on my book, uh, their uh, uh, generosity not only in, in saying nice things about it, uh, the book, but <laughs> but also in unsettling me <laughs> with doubts, <laughs> which will, which will no doubt contribute to um, uh, further work. Um, I, I, I want to thank uh, the Post Keynesian uh, Economic Society for uh, sponsoring this, uh, a, a particular to Gary, uh, who has spoken, uh, uh, Eva Kavovsky, who's uh, helped to, uh, to organize this. Um, I want to thank the Economics Department for uh, supplying uh, Yanis Dafermos to, uh, to welcome us all uh, on behalf of the department uh, for, for, for also for paying uh, for the reception which awaits us uh, uh, downstairs in uh, uh, SG37 after, we, uh, after we've had some discussion. Um, I, I, uh, uh, Oxford University Press. I, I, I really want to thank uh, Oxford University Press for uh, publishing this book, uh, publishing it with footnotes. You know, for those of us that uh, write books, regret the time, uh, 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 regret the trend in, in, in publishing or putting the footnotes at the back. 
so you've lost your place by the time you've chased up the footnote, uh, or at the end of the chapter, in which case you have to uh, uh, look for the chapter. Oxford University Press is still doing footnotes. So I'm, uh, I'm very uh, pleased uh, about that. Uh, the uh, Oxford University Press also offered copies of this book uh, for a sale at uh, 45 a pound a discount of 20 pounds or 45 pounds. Uh, I thought this was outrageous because I, I actually have uh, an author's discount to buy them at 40 pounds. So if, <laughs> if you want to buy a copy, I will make available to you a copy for 40 pounds. I have <laughs> copies here. Um, uh, the, uh, the title, which I think Gary referred to, uh, the, the title actually comes from uh, the, the title of Bern uh, uh a classic book on uh, interest and capital. Uh, and, uh, it, it, uh, uh, and reverses, uh, uh, in a sense, what Bern did was uh, put forward a view that's utterly opposite to the one that I put here. Uh, Bern Bavec argued that uh, the rate of interest really doesn't need much explanation. Uh, the, the real, uh, what he meant by the rate of interest was the rate of profit, and that does need uh, uh, explanation. Uh, true up to a point, but uh, the rate of interest uh, is still there. And I agree with Jeff uh, uh, on this. It does require explanation. Um, even if one's critical of the properties attributed to it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Victoria Chick, uh, from whom I learned the fundamentals uh, of monetary economics. Uh, Jeff Tiley, who, who shared with me this education in monetary economics um, uh, with, with Vicky, but went in the direction of uh, Keynes's ideas in, in debt management. And if we had more time, uh, I, I, I would explain the difference between Keynes's ideas of debt management and Kalecki's, but uh, uh, it's, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it as, uh, as an interesting topic for someone's, uh, 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 for an article. Um, Bill Allen, uh, I, I want to thank in particular Big for his, uh, his book on uh, the Bank of England and the government debt, uh, which came out unfortunately too late uh, for me. By that time I had written uh, most of this book, but it's, it, it's fundamental because he looks at uh, quite a lot of the same um, uh, trans, uh, 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 the same material that I looked at, that Kalitsky was commenting on, on war finance. Uh, uh, Bill actually looks at it from the point of view of what the Bank of England was doing uh, and its contribution to, uh, to debt management. So, uh, you know, uh, I owe I, I, I think the, 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 the book deserves, uh, Bill's book deserves a higher profile than I gave it in, in, in this, in my book. Um, I uh, just want to record uh, with sadness my debts to two people, Jezra Shatinsky and Julio Lopez. Jezra Shatinsky was the editor of uh, Kalecki's Collected works who died in uh, 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 at the beginning of February, and Julio Lopez, who died uh, two year, uh, nearly two years ago. Uh, with Julio Lopez, I was, uh, sorry, with Jezra Shatinsky, I was working on a book uh, on Kalecki and Bretton Woods. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to overload you, but this book is now available. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, just to forewarn you, 
it will be uh, 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 it will be the subject of a presentation uh, uh, later this year. Uh, let me just say uh, uh, make a few comments on uh, uh, on the substance uh, of the book. Um, I I mention in there that Kalitsky's ideas didn't change much. Uh, through his life. His equations did. I mean, he saw himself as a pure mathematician. Um, and um, so what he did in successive volumes of essays uh, on the business cycle uh, was that he, he, he tended to change the equations uh, and then he, he tended to drop the material uh, on uh, the, 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 uh, or include some material on, on monetary economics, only to drop it uh, later on. So uh, what I do in this book is in the first part of the book, it picks up these uh, fragments. Uh, in the first chapter, this is uh, concerned with the financing of investment. Uh, then there is the, um, uh, uh, the his criticism of the Excelian theory. Now this is, uh, this is the sore point for uh, for Jeff. Uh, this the idea that there is a relationship between the rate of interest and the business cycle and inflation. Um, and then uh, I, the, there's uh, uh, it is a, a, a further a couple of chapters on debt management in the context of world war finance. Uh, and this includes uh, Kalitsky's critique of the Bretton Woods plans. And what I do then in my book is uh, 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 there's a middle section which discusses some fundamental uh, principles. I, I talk about um, a, 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 I think one, one or two of the speakers have, have mentioned this, this idea of capitalist money and uh, let me just give you some uh, some quotations from uh, from an early uh, 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 just to show that this isn't uh, a peculiarity of uh, of Kalitsky. Um, in in his early draft of his general theory in a draft entitled monetary, the monetary production theory, uh, Keynes. Uh, cited in, in a typically equivocal style, um, a pregnant observation uh, made by uh, Karl Marx. So the subsequent use to which he put this observation was, according to Keynes, was highly illogical. Uh, 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 in Keynes's view, uh, 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 according to Keynes, Marx pointed out that the nature, the nature of production in the actual world is not, as some economists seem often to suppose, a case of transforming commodities into money and then uh, 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 the money, uh, 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 you know, using the money to obtain another commodity or more commodity uh, or effort. As Keynes said, that may be the standpoint of the private consumer, uh, but it is not the attitude of business, which is a case of money being transfer, uh, being used uh, to buy commodities, uh, which is used, which are exchanged for even more money. In other words, for parting with money, com uh, commodity or effort in order to obtain more money. So this is Keynes explicitly endorsing this idea that uh, it's capitalists who have the money who, and in turning it over in the markets, they are trying to make more money. Uh, Keynes uh, gave the source of his Marxian discovery as H.L. McCracken's uh, value theory and the business cycle rather than Marx himself, and then went into pole uh, typical Keynes, went into pole polemics with the underconsumption is Hobson, Foster and Cutchins, Major Douglas, uh, and so on. That idea uh, uh, of, of capitalist money was not so uh, 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 
it was not just in Keynes. Uh, you find a similar argument uh, being put in um, the uh, in, in Rosa Luxemburg in her anti-critique. Uh, Luxembourg went into a somewhat prolix discussion of the social requirements necessary for production in a capitalist economy, including the division of labor production of capitalist uh, uh, economy. The ex but the exchange of commodities on the market is an internal or family matter among capitalists. The required money for this process, of course, comes out of the capitalist pockets as every employer must lay out the money capital in advance and returns into the pockets of the capitalist class after exchange on the market has taken place. So this is, uh, uh, this is Luxembourg's version of what uh, Keynes had just said. And then we have Kalitsky's uh, version um, uh, in his uh, essay on the business cycle, but then this is a point that recurs later on. Uh, it's referring to the technical elements of the money market, uh, a, 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 in which he's trying to explain why investment is possible without prior savings. This is because the expenditure of capitalists is converted into profits for others. The outlay on construction of a fixed asset is by no means frozen as some people think and released only as the capital is written off, but is already returned in the course of construction in the form of profits accruing to the firms whose sales are directly or indirectly connected with the construction. If during a particular period more money is spent, i.e. out of bank deposits, then pro tanto, more money flows back into the banks in the form of realized profits. So this is Kalecki arguing that it's, uh, 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 you, you, you don't need more money, you need uh, a, a higher turnover of uh, the money that's already there. Um, Let's uh, 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 let me move on with the um, Kaletsky's. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, the fiscal management of debt, which Jeff mentioned. Uh, Yes, this is important, um, but it's important in order not to cause a rise in liquidity preference. So it's at, at one point, uh, Kalecki writes about the importance in debt management, that you've got a certain level of liquidity preference. What uh, Kalecki meant by this was a certain proportion of wealth portfolios, which uh, wealthy people want to hold as liquid assets, then uh, the government uh, should be issuing bonds in, in proportion to that debt, uh, short-term bonds and long-term bonds in proportion uh, to that debt. Um, why? Because the banking system will expand uh, credit to uh, maintain uh, this kind of uh, 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 maintain the funds available uh, for uh, the uh, 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 for investment in these assets. In fact, when as the government spends that money, that uh, uh, that money will accrue to these wealth portfolios. So it, it, it's a uh, it's a time problem rather than anything else. Uh, the uh, it, this is where actually development economics comes in uh, with an, an interesting uh, differentiation, uh, different circuit, because whereas in the capitalist economy, money goes from one capitalist pocket into another capitalist pocket, uh, in developing countries, it, the money that uh, capitalists and governments spend uh, go into the pockets of the pre-capitalists, 
wealthy classes, the landowners, moneylenders, and so on. And for him, for Kalitsky, financing development is really all about making sure that they don't have too much of this money so that uh, the financial system becomes unstable. Um, I no one's mentioned the the fable on 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 debt repayment, which is actually it, it took me a while to work out is is really the fundamental explanation of why it is that um, it's liquidity that is needed for debt management. Uh, rather than uh, a surplus or a profit uh, from the real economy. Um, so uh, let me conclude by, by making uh, a few links with the uh, monetary economics and the monetary dilemmas of our time. We live in a time of uh, in, uh, 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 of neo this uh, resurgence since the 1980s of this idea that uh, the economy can be regulated uh, by the rate of interest and monetary policy committees uh, uh, sitting down together and agreeing a cha uh, 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 changes in the rate of interest. Uh, this goes entirely contrary to uh, Kalecki's uh, ideas, I would ar argue also even to, uh, to Keynes's uh, uh, you know, uh, I ideas, um, the, the, the whole uh, uh, what, but so the, we, the, the arguments that Kalecki was making um, really have to be made again, and I try to do this in the book. Uh, but the other intriguing uh, uh, and relevant point for today is, uh, 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 is the discussion of debt management. It's absolutely clear that after, uh, after COVID, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the rise in, in government debt, uh, we are much more uh, in a situation like that during the, the Second World War, when debt management is, uh, is hugely important. And this is why the final uh, uh, this section of this book is on central bank operations and securities. And concluding on, uh, the, uh, on this idea that inflation targeting taken too far, given the limitations of, uh, of economic forecasting, really simply makes monetary policy endogenous uh, to the business cycle. So I, uh, I, I want to once again thank thank all the speakers. Uh, well, I guess we have a, we have some time for discussion. I hope so. Yes. Uh, thank you, Yannick. Thank you very much. <laughs> Time for a few questions from the floor. I'm sorry, I won't call most of you by name because I can't see you very well. Um, but raise your hand and, and address the person to whom your comment is, is directed. <laughs> yes? Andrew Trigg. Ah. One question was the power of monetary policy and interest rates. With interest rates so low in recent times, how does that relate to the um, what you were saying about the power of monetary policy? Surely that's happened. Keynes, is, Keynes wanted interest rates near to zero. They're not far from zero. They're, they're, they're negative in real terms with inflation. Also, um, quantitative easing. Um, I wonder what the panel thought about uh, the impact on income distribution, on inequality of quantitative easing. Yes. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's the right question, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't think... 
I don't think interest rates are that low. I think uh, the interest rates on government bonds in advanced economies are incredibly low. Maybe in some other economies are pretty low. But if you if you want to take a, a view of the broader return to wealth, uh, if you want to regard the interest rate as a broader return to wealth, then it's incredibly high. Um, lot, lots of post Keynesians are writing at the moment about the search for yield. Uh, you know, since the global financial crisis, when policy rates have, have gone low, um, there has been a search for yield. So investors are looking overseas for Turkish corporate bonds or, or whatever you want, re real estate bonds and things like that. So I think a lot of money is, is being channeled into high return investments, perhaps too much money channeled into high return investments, which are, which are probably dangerous. And, and fundamentally, I think it's a different kind of a cheap money policy to the sort of cheap money policy that Keynes envisaged, Keynes in, envisaged, envisaged a very regulated financial regime, he envisaged capital control and so on and so forth. So he wanted low interest rates that would, that would directly affect investments in the, in the domestic economy and, and likewise for other economies. So I think that that world is quite different. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, Keynes wanted cheap money and he thought that, you know, certainly in the first instance, you had to stop interest rates being high to stop the Great Depression. So that, that bit was kind of succeeded. But then at that point, you, you might still need fiscal policy because the MEC has collapsed. Um, firms don't have any confidence. So you need some fiscal policy to get things going and, and contrary to um, much discourse. There was fiscal policy in the 1930s. There was fiscal policy in the UK, and of course, there was fiscal policy in the US under the New Deal. So policymakers were were acting to to support the economy, which was pushing the MEC out from the sort of slumped one to a, to a better place. So things were getting so things were were working in a way that they're not doing now because that's that's one thing. You know, it's not it's now it's all about monetary policy. It's all about the power of the bank, the bank of England. It's all about QE. Um, but it's been nothing about fiscal policy. So it's that there's a sort of answer in that ramble, that, that one, it's it's a very different cheap money policy that we've got at the moment, um, not, not in a regulated environment and, and an absence of fiscal policy. Um, and I think it's probably a dangerous cheap money policy as, as well at the moment because of the, the way money is being pushed into all sorts of investments around the world that might be a bit precarious. I and mean, you know, we might be seeing some retreat from those investments at the moment. Um, but yeah, top. You asked about inequality um, and I haven't got anything very profound to say. Uh, except to make the obvious point that you have to distinguish between wealth inequality and income inequality and that wealth inequality will have been inflated, if you like, by quantitative easing, which has forced down bond yields and forced up asset prices so that the wealth of people who owned assets already has gone up, whereas that of those who didn't hasn't. Um, and one might expect that as quantitative easing ends or even gets reversed, if ever ever happens, that the wealth inequality will adjust back. Income inequality, I, I, I have uh, no explanation of, and I think that it's that the causes must be quite profound and they're certainly beyond my comprehension. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let me just say a word about uh, inequality and QE. Um, in a sense, the, just to comment that uh, I, I pointed to the provocative dis distinction that Jan makes in his book between the money of the state and then the money of capitalists. And um, one thing that that leads back to it, and I, as I was uh, preparing my remarks, I was thinking, well, you know, the financial system and backstop by the Fed and so on is kind of in his category of the money of the state. And uh, the, the idea is the capitalists are taking care of themselves and so on. And uh, in a certain way, quantitative easing is the extension of that. What we see is the explosion of asset prices, widening inequality, uh, disenfranchised workers, um, and angry and taking self-destructive actions such as Brexit and 
election of Donald Trump and all of that. Um, and I think in some sense, the question, uh, one reason to really read and reflect on Jan's book is, because I, I already debated this with Silvana, uh, was what is a capitalist? You know, what is a capitalist? Is, is that, you know, that buccaneer, I'll eat you for lunch capitalist, you know, the Bill Gross types, um, financial capitalists in our day, are they the same ultimately? Jan provocatively said, well, M, M prime. Okay, fair enough. What about the C in the middle? What about the labor that used to earn that money? Now you say, yeah, it goes across borders. That's right. Uh, but that problem is now globalized. So I think that, you know, there's a profound reflection that we all have to have, because if I'm not mistaken, the Labor Party itself was going very softly, softly when it came to their chance, even under the Corbyn days, to critique the city of London. Everybody's afraid about that beast. And these people are what? They're basically, you know, tax haven enabled, uh, tax payment avoiding, shall we tax wealth or shall we just let everybody pay more money and turn off their heat this coming winter. You know, these issues are right on the table and we have to ask ourselves, who is this capitalist? And uh, what is the relationship to something called labor? So while I challenged the adequacy of those, and, and of course, you know, we, we rip each other apart, the working class versus the Afro-Caribbean Britons and the, all that, you know, we rip each other apart. But basically um, those questions are there who is labor, who is capital, and how does that come together? Those are the fundamental things that in Koleski's work are always front and center, and in Jan's work. Uh, Mahanda Shumorska, thank you very much for the excellent contributions. Um, my uh, question piggybacks a little bit on Andrew's. Um, a lot of the speakers rightly criticized the rather narrow space that monetary policy uh, occupies these days, mainly focusing on interest rate management and uh, to some extent open market operations. So my question firstly directed to Jan, based on Kaletsky's monetary economics, what new action or intervention could monetary policy take to think a bit more creatively about ensuring prosperity um, in, in the light of the challenges that we face today. Uh, and I would also welcome other speakers to contribute to, to answering that question based on, on your expertise. Thank you very much. Uh, um, can, can, can I just say that the, um, the, the, the I think the real function of the, uh, uh, of the central bank in, in this situation uh, is a technical one and it should be this one of uh, a, a assistance with debt management. Uh, if you want to call it um, the, uh, you know, the broker of last resort or, 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 or whatever. Uh, the, it, it's really to, to maintain and regulate the, the, the liquidity of the, uh, of the capital markets so that the government uh, can uh, issue the bonds or, 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 or obtain the financing that it needs, uh, but also so, that, uh, so as to ensure that the markets do not get so liquid uh, that uh, that they become unstable, uh, and the, that's um, you know I, I think it's 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 this technical role. I'm a, I, I'm I'm, a, I'm in this respect. I guess I'm a bit old fashioned. I I think that they um, I I believe that it, well, it's the same thing about banking as well. I think I think they should maintain a low profile. Uh, and not <laughs> and not put themselves forward as uh, as masters of the universe because uh, uh, that that way lies hubris and disaster. Anyone else? I, I agree completely with everything that Yan said. I think that when people join central banks, they should be required, like doctors, to take the Hippocratic oath: first, do no harm. Um, and the harm that they could do is, as Jan said, to um, not um, uh, uh, do what they need to do 
to enable governments to finance themselves properly. And uh, importantly, too, to contain surges in inflation, which uh, do great social damage and need to be stopped. Gary? Just a couple of quick thoughts. The one is that um, keep in mind that um, actually uh, everybody will remember the rebuilding macroeconomics project that uh, NISER sponsored. And uh, some work was done by some people in this room and, and I participated in some of those dialogues. And one of the dialogues was whether or not in the view of many of the, part of the core participants, whether fiscal policy still counted as macro policy. Uh, so that this, this reminder of these connections is, is fundamentally important uh, because that was, it was just written out uh, by many people. And uh, you, the Masters of the Universe comment is right on point. Uh, there's, there's things you can do, but you can't do everything. And so in some sense, uh, there, and that's where actually then the management of debt becomes something that is a way of refreshing and renewing some of that commitment to social spending when necessary, support payments when necessary, and so on. That it's that we're not living in a world in which every household has to balance its budget every year, every month, therefore so much the state. This is a way of reinterpreting and refreshing that argument that compassionate uh, and, and constructive approaches to infrastructure and social welfare have to be part of the discussion. Uh, when I was working in California with the legislature there, uh, the very wise uh, woman who was in charge of the state, the set of the finance for the, the state, used to say a budget is about who you are as a people. And uh, that's something that gets completely forgotten um, in, in these days. I can't resist this one either. Um, and, and basically, I, I agree. I, I think one of the but the trouble is, I think the horse may have bolted here. You know, we, we should have done fiscal policy in 2008 uh, to, to get the economy going and then start thinking about what a, a proper economic system might look like. Uh, but we didn't. Uh, so the QE, I suspect, has, has fostered more for that, you know, rather than resolve the crisis. I suspect it's ex exacerbated the debt imbalances and the financial disarray. Uh, so it, it makes me quite fearful, you know, that, so maybe there is no easy answer to the question because as a result of not doing the right things 10 years ago, we might have created a, a bigger mess that will be even harder to clear up now. Yes? Oh, he's leaving. No, he's not leaving. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Cheers. Uh, yeah, thanks for this. Um, particularly interested, to, particularly um, from Jan, um, your view on whether interest rates themselves can actually um, have much of an effect on inflation, particularly on the inflation we're seeing at the moment. And I guess back to similar to other questions, whether you know we should be looking at non-interest um, rate mechanisms. Um, whether that is other forms of monetary policy, like uh, people have been talking a, a bit about um, the use of reserve requirements, um, which I think was a, a debate in the, the 1970s about um, how that should be done. Um, but also, I guess, what other policies, fiscal policy, um, or, or is there nothing we can do when it's, you know, supply side inflation? Yeah. Okay. I um on on the on the question of uh, of inflation and the, the 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 rate of interest um i i would uh, uh, refer you to uh what keynes called gibson's paradox this is in uh, the treatise on, on on money what's gibson's paradox well gibson's paradox was discovered in the uh, uh, by a statistician called Gibson in the 19th century. It really goes back to uh, Took and his history of prices uh, in, in, in the mid uh, uh, in, in an early, uh, in, in, in the middle de decades of the 19th century. Um, this is uh, the discovery that uh, uh, 
interest rate, if you look at uh, the, the progress of interest rates and the progress of inflation, they're both um, uh, uh, pro-cyclical variables. They both tend to rise in the boom and fall in the recession. And the, uh, uh, the, the real question is, how can that be? Well, uh, because the whole uh, the, 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 the whole of uh, uh, the, the, the kind of neo Vixelian project is around the idea that they should be inverse, that you raise interest rates and the rate of inflation should come down. Um, and, uh, but, it, but it doesn't historically. And uh, it, 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 the, the, the way it's got round in this uh, by in the statistical models is to introduce lags and of course if you uh, introduce the appropriate lags you 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 can get uh, you can bring back your idea that uh, yes if you raise interest rates now then in a year and a half to two years time this may bring down the um, the uh, the rate of inflation uh, but it may not on the uh, on the non-interest rate uh, mechanism uh, uh, mechanisms, reserve requirements, and so on. Yes, I think that one, um, uh, you know, one does need to um, maintain uh, 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 control credit. Um, but I think one of the ways in which one, uh, one of the important ways in which one can do this is by uh, controlling the liquidity in securities markets. Banking today is all about uh, lending against uh, security. And if they, um, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, if the bank, if the central bank is doing its job properly, regulating the liquidity of securities markets, uh, they, they, there should be less of this, uh, 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 you know, Less pressure on uh, uh, on, on asset prices, uh, and less less possibility that the um, that the system will become unstable. But it's not uh, uh, it, 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 it's not something where where, where where there's a simple answer. And the the problem with um, you know the 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 the, the, the the old joke about you know the to every complex uh, uh, difficult uh, problem there is a solution that's uh, uh, simple, clear, and wrong. <laughs> and the, it's the simplicity. You know, any sim uh, if anyone comes comes forward with a simple uh, solution, the chances are it's uh, it's wrong. And it, and, it, uh, and uh, the rate of interest inflation targeting was one of those. Um, at least one of the questions was, can interest rates be effective in dealing with cost-driven inflation? And um, I think that it's helpful in thinking about that to look back at the pandemic, when the main features were firstly that production went down a lot because people couldn't go to work and um, uh, 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 production facilities closed down, um, but incomes were maintained by furlough schemes and other government subventions, so that there was a very large budget deficit. So households in aggregate, not every one, but in aggregate, built up large amounts of money because they couldn't spend it, but they were getting paid it. And it's not entirely surprising that when the whole thing came to an end, they could go out and spend money the prices went up because they all wanted to do have improvements and whatever. Um, that was foreseeable and it could have been dealt with either by taxing away some or all of the money that was floating around or by putting up interest rates so that there was an incentive to save it rather than spend it. If either of those things had happened, then the demand for products wouldn't have gone up and the prices wouldn't have gone up. So the answer to your question, I think, is unequivocally yes. Right. And, and during that lockdown, I uh, and after I saw uh, Jagjit Chada, the director of NISER, consistently make the point 
uh, in these meetings of treasury folk and others uh, on these Tuesday morning sessions that um, yeah, people, people got the savings. We need to spend money. What's the problem? Uh, there was no problem. But I, I would also just comment that you're gonna see uh, a pillaring of the Federal Reserve Chair uh, in the US and the Bank of England chair here because they're faced with almost impossibly complex choices with no simple answers, as Yana said. And it's just easy to make actually both of them whipping boys or, uh, well, we acted too late, we didn't do the right thing. It's, it's way more complicated. And uh, so we have to be careful. There was not a magic bullet that could have been fired. I think, I think um, maybe there isn't a magic good bullet um, and the, the problems of coming out of the pandemic are obviously incredibly complicated and the, the, the nature of global so supply chains, the lack of production at home. Um, but I think that we have to distinguish what's happened since the pandemic with what was going on before the pandemic, because I think before the pandemic, the major problem in the world goes back to that uh, distributional question was that wealth had an awful lot of money and labor didn't have a lot of money. Um, and yeah, Jan alluded to underconsumption and overproduction arguments. And I think that was probably the more dominant feature of the, the global economy, that the global economy had been producing too much for too little spending power. So uh, for me, that was the underlying situation before the crisis. And of course, policymakers kept trying to somehow make that better by reducing spending power even more. Uh, which wasn't working, then we have the pandemic and a, a different set of problems. But I don't think it, it gets away from the fact that there's this very fundamental dislocation between a mass of wealth in the hands of very few people and just not enough money in the hands of, of workers and people who buy stuff. So whatever the answer to the immediate question of inflation, the, the bigger questions are around that broader distribution between wealth and labor. And I think it's very important not to lose sight of this and turn it into whether central bankers are doing the right thing or the wrong thing at the moment, because as Gary says, they, they've, you know, they've been dealt a very bad hand, but you know, maybe they started it in 1980 or whatever. So far, we haven't had an answer which is simple but wrong. Not so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, going back to the question about inflation, whether it's demand driven or cost driven. Um, I've been doing some work on this and the US at this point in time, inflation in the US is slightly different to inflation in the Eurozone. There are different factors affecting trends. It's the demand factor is stronger in the US. It almost doesn't exist in the Eurozone. And that's one point. And if you look at the actual figures, uh, statistics, then you see that half the inflation rate in the Eurozone is due to two things, energy and unprocessed foods. So to my mind, this is a very clearly cost driven. And I have the same question as a colleague there. I think, I think raising interest rates at this point in time, at least in the Eurozone is wrong. And somehow Lagarde seems to be holding back. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm looking for this simple but wrong answer, and I don't have that. You know, I, okay, if that's wrong, what do you do? Price controls? Galbraith, 1970s, said price controls, strategic, big firms that you can't control, uh, that you can actually, you know, follow in and control, supervise, survey. You uh, price makers, in other words. So there is no, I mean, taxing is is another sort of probably a uh, way of going about it. But it is a big question right now. And interest, uh, raising interest rates probably will produce, you know, recession, sort of deep in recession. So we'll have the next set of problems to be discussing soon. Thanks. Let me just start an answer to that by just mentioning that uh, a colleague who worked in our country is now moved to UMass Amherst, Isabella Weber, um, has written a very well-received book about China, very excellent book. And uh, she made a, she did an op-ed, I think, in the New York Times or it's, Guardian. the Guardian. Okay, in which she basically took it and you know she analogized and said, "Isn't this a time to start thinking about it for the reasons you're mentioning?" And she, speaking of pillorying, she was pilloried 
by no less than Paul Krugman in a, in a sexist and gendered way. Now he backed off, he's an arrogant guy as we know, but, um, but still I, I would ask the question because we've got people here with uh, great government experience in the UK. Uh, would, would we reach a point where price controls uh, even in some of the sectors such as you're mentioning would, could be on the table for this government or another government? <laughs> can, can, I, can, I, can, I can imagine it. I mean, I yeah. think it would be a um, it, it would it would happen if there'd been a serious failure yeah. uh, to contain inflation by fiscal policy or monetary policy. Yeah. But if you get into a really chaotic, yeah. uh, dislocated, disordered situation. Yeah, it might happen. Not impossible with trade war with Europe and all of that. Possible, yeah. Can, can I say that the the, the very significant intervention here is uh, has been Mario Draghi's uh, suggestion that uh, what we need in Europe is a, um, a, a, a is an oil uh, energy uh, cons a, a cartel uh, formed within Europe uh, and. You know, you know, if anything is is going to make that kind of price control work, it will be it will be something like this, and coming from the uh, the mouth of the former uh, head of the European Central Bank. Yeah, but that's where Jan. You know, in your book, again, people need to read the book and reflect on it because you at various key points talk about how. There's a need for planning and, con and control, and it has to be cross-border. Um, what are those institutions? You know, uh, we have the different rules. They're even debating in Europe. What are the rules we're going to use? Majority rule, et cetera. You know, are they going to change some of the things? So where is that that cartel of, of consumers? What would be the mechanism? OECD? Come on. You know, that's not going to happen. Where, you know, how would that work? Um, and so on. There, there's huge institutional challenges to be resolved, even at the global scale, even as we speak. I guess we need to go to your Bretton Woods book. <laughs> Can I be cheeky and ask two short questions? Um, first one, um, you mentioned the shortening of maturity of the Bank of England balance sheet and sort of consolidated public liabilities as a result of, of QE. Um, do you think there's a danger that the bank gets worried about as interest rates rise, bond yields um, rise, capital losses and costs to the balance sheet and react by um perhaps aggressively trying to sell off quantitative tightening because it, has, it doesn't have the option of letting them mature in the same way that the us does because because they're shorter if it did that what do you think the effects might be particularly in terms of financial stability and, and government debt management and can i just quickly ask one other short question um my reading of kaletsky as gary pointed out and to a degree joan robinson is is that they mention monetary things here and there sort of for a few pages and then, and then move on. Is it because they just don't think they're that important and interesting? And it's sort of obvious how public balance sheet works and, and bank mechanics of, of lending works. Um, in contrast to some economics today, there's lots of discussion about the sort of nitty gritty of, of, of monetary balance sheets. It, it, what would Kaletsky and Joan Robinson think of sort of modern monetary discussions um would it be fair to say that there's there's too much focus or, or is, is it another reason that their their comments are so scattered so i stop there thank you well you first um it's a i mean it's a very big question um the bank of england unfortunately bought very long maturity bonds so the half-life of their portfolio is eight years which means that by 2030, they'd still have half as many as they've got now, which would almost certainly be too many. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 obviously, selling them actively in the market is a kind of slightly more scary thing to do 
than just letting them run off. There's no particular reason, I think, if why it should be more disruptive to the market. It's just kind of bureaucratically more intimidating because it's something you're kind of doing yourself rather than something you're letting happen. Um, to my mind, by far the best way of doing it would be, uh, well, there are two ways of doing it, but it, uh, I've, I've proposed one way of doing it in one sense rather quickly, but I won't go into that because life's too short. Um, but if they're going to just do it uh, in the way that you would expect, I think that the simplest thing to do would be just to say every year to the debt management office, we'd like you to sell this amount on our behalf. And then they combine that with the regular debt management sales program. Uh, the guys in the debt management office know what they're doing. And that's probably quite the, the least disruptive way of doing it. I can't see why that should be particularly problematic, but obviously there'll be a limit to the amount that they could do each year. And it might not be predictable at the end, at the beginning of the year, how much they'd be able to get through that year. There might be complications, uh, but again, uh, we haven't really got time. Well, I haven't got time to go through them unless you want to be here all evening. Yeah, yeah, the last, yeah, second question, I think, is for you. Do you like to speak? No, no, no. It's the second question. Sorry, I was uh, taken. What was the second question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I think that the um, Kalitsky and uh, John Robinson were, were mostly writing in, in this long period uh, between uh, 1929 and, I guess, the, 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 the 1970s. Um, when the uh, 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 when the financial systems around the world had, uh, had, had become uh, discredited, had become uh, illiquid, and the, uh, 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 the you know this caused all, all uh, uh, you know a whole heap of problems for government uh, debt management, which actually uh, you know Bill describes. Bill writes about in, in, in his book uh, quite nicely because the, uh, the the capital markets, the bond markets, were relatively uh, illiquid. Uh, I think what they what's happened since then in, 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 is the nineteen seventies, uh, nineteen nineteen eighties. You have you know the 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 shift in pension fund. Uh, shift towards funded pension schemes, the pouring of money into uh, in, into capital markets, uh, another uh, you know boom and bust after two thousand. So you you have a, um, a, a you know the, the, there is a sense in which finance has become much more visible uh, because it's more unstable. And I guess they were probably if they if they were around in. Uh, uh, at the turn of the twentieth, uh, twenty-first uh, uh, century, they would they would have uh, uh, they, they would possibly have written much much more about finance. Um, but it was uh, at the time when they were writing, uh, you know, it fi you know finance was something that, that caused problems for 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 government uh, uh, borrowing. It caused uh, it was causing problems, the problems of international debt, which had to be managed, but not. Uh, uh, in, in, in not the, the type of problem, the problems of instability, instability of asset prices, which we've uh, uh, come to be used to. Perhaps one more question. There is one. Uh, I, I was just asking for a clarification. I don't know, maybe Jan or Gary. You mentioned that the book challenges the way stock flow consistent modeling, um, the place of equilibrium. So I didn't really catch it. Like, how do you, what's the place the equilibrium takes in stock flow consistent modeling? And what is the challenge? Just a clarification. Okay, just briefly. Um, 
the where uh, when Tobin and Brainard, there's a paper from I think 1968 where they talk about the, the adding up constraint and the fact that you know there's a there's a kind of Balra's law thing or you know that that if if n minus one markets are in equilibrium then the nth will be as well but when you do one of these models uh, if you if you're kind of looking at n minus one markets whatever you're not taking care of is going to be sloshed into the nth market and you could have some very perverse and unanticipated um, you know implications for what would have happened to everyone's portfolio so they the, it's a warning that you have to make sure that everything's going to balance out that you know there now that's those are models that are full of substitution effects and lots of interest rate and risk and all this stuff it's a real you know uh, sort of uh, market efficiency kind of a frame now as we take that forward into our era and and so on uh, that logic still pertains because of course it is true that you always have to watch for that when you do something that has multiple assets a model with multiple assets and especially when you're tracking dynamics through time you're always pulled back to that equilibrium and that becomes a test of whether or not a model is a good model is one of the tests um, it, it becomes a real constraint in the sense that you are insisting that everything's going to add up using the asset markets uh, and, and their quasi equilibrium as the frame for that, while lots of other stuff can be going on in the flow space of your model that you're not controlling for. So this is why I said it's, it's I mean, Giannis was up here and he's one of the one of the real masters of this uh, sort of approach and yeah, uh, Joe's here and there's people in this room who are just amazing at it. And, um, and the challenge is, you know, how do you tell stories about the dynamics, the flow dynamics or the circuits, whatever you want to call it, in real time, talking about the dynamic with a rich enough frame of asset markets that you've got a, a real economic framework to talk about, especially in our age of financialization. We're going to need, you know, asset markets, we're going to need debt markets and so on. Uh, how do you do that in a way that doesn't sell out your, your description of the real movement through time to implicitly a return to an equilibrium that you don't believe in? That model insists on it. But I saw um, one of our friends from uh, Limerick University uh, just, again, uh, pilloried in a uh, rebuilding macroeconomic session by one of the leaders of that uh, enterprise and basically, basically said, don't tell me about stock flow consistent modeling. Every general equilibrium model, every DSGE that we insist on as our badge of honor, what we do as neoclassical economists, we always are stock flow consistent. Now, and I, I mean, what I did not say, because it was not the moment, would have been, that's because there ain't nothing going on in your model. Uh, <laughs> but that was not the moment to make that comment. <laughs> Well, I think it's time that we stop this session, sad though it is, uh, and I hope that you'll join me in thanking all our wonderful speakers for this afternoon's entertainment. Enjoy. <laughs>
is it? They can. Am I okay? Where, where's, where's the? Oh yes, yeah. yes, you're close to that. Yeah, Hello, how are you? Oh. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you just now. I, I mean, I mean, there's some people. Did it? Uh, yeah, I buy a couple of things. Yeah, I'm not getting close. Uh oh. Uh oh. Send it again. I need a long. Send it again. I don't know where it went. I'm very, very sorry. Yeah, you're more. 